The name of the book, and it releases, I believe, Tuesday. Yes, on Tuesday. Church of Cowards from our old friend Matt Walsh over at The Daily Wire. Matt, it's good to have you back here on The Steve Day Show, brother. How you been? Doing well. How about you? Could be a little bit better, but I could be a lot worse, if you know what I'm saying. All right? So I got to tell you, I, I know that you really strive for nuance and, and subtlety. The, the title here, it seems vague to me. What you're going for, Matt, with Church of Cowards. Can you kind of um, uh, define for us exactly what it is, um, you're, you're, who it is you're hitting at here? And you, yeah, yes, note the, star, note the sarcasm. Yes. Yeah, I was afraid that, uh, I was afraid my point wasn't clear enough in the title. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you gave me the chance to explain that. Well, I mean, it is, it is, of course, uh, you know, jokes aside, it is, it's supposed to be pretty, pretty clear that um, when I talk about a church of cowards, I think that that um, cowardice and complacency, apathy, um, a lack of authenticity, you know, these are the things that are plaguing the church in America. When I say the church, I mean Christianity as a whole in America. And also when I talk about that, as I, as I go into in the book, um, it's not just about the church leaders, although they do come in, in, in my book, they come in for quite a, a lot of criticism that is well-deserved, I think. But it's not just about the leaders. It's also about the just normal people in the pews, uh, you know, you and I, uh, that, that I think also we, we need to look in the mirror and um, and see some of the stuff within ourselves as well. One of the things I have said to audiences I've spoken to and with over the years is that if you believe ultimately in the sovereignty of God, then corporately, uh, on, on a cultural level, you have to accept that you have as much evil as you are willing to tolerate. That you are you're willing to tolerate, um, you know, uh, three thousand children being executed every single day, and until the church has decided it doesn't want to tolerate it anymore, like the church didn't want to tolerate racism anymore in the fifties and the sixties with the civil rights movement, until the church has decided um, that it doesn't want to tolerate certain ills those things will be permitted. And I think that kind of speaks to the, 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 the cowardice and complacency that you're addressing there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that we're very used to, uh, whether it's in the church or just as Americans as a whole, we look around at the culture and we say, oh, how did, how did things get this way? It's so terrible. We, we, and we feel like victims. But of course, we have to realize that you know if, if we really were going to not tolerate it, if we, if we really decided we didn't want things to be this way, they wouldn't be this way, and uh, and they are this way because this is what this is what we want. And I realize when I say we, that's a the general we it doesn't apply necessarily to everyone. But I mean, you bring up the, um, the babies being killed every day. You know, a million babies approximately a year being killed through abortion. And of course, many of us, myself, yourself, and pro-lifers, we're very opposed to it. Hopefully, we're actually doing things to not just speak out about it, but to to contribute to the pro-life cause. But I think even with us, we have to stop and think. Well. We're really doing enough. I mean, are are we as angry about this as we should be? Are we treating this the way we should be treating it, or have or, or have we even uh, sort of fallen into complacency and accepted it as normal? And I think that we have. So that is yeah, that's that's what it's about. It's about it's about facing, uh, as I said, facing that within ourselves. Where's the wake up call then come from? What gets us out of our complacency? Well, I think it has to. You know, the wake up call has to begin with. With all of us, you know, listening to what we're saying and realizing that it also includes us. I mean, most of what I talk about in Church of Cowards, um, I think that you know the average conservative, certainly the average conservative Christian, will agree with. I don't think that there's a there's a lot in there that they're going to necessarily disagree with. Um, so it's not it's not really about telling you something that you didn't know. It's about it's about you know confronting these these realities. And then um, and realizing that that we're a part of it. One of my great frustrations when it comes to complacency within the church is when it comes to um, statism, progressivism, socialism, whatever name du jour we want to use today. Because I, I think one of the errors that the, the church in America is making is seeing these things as rival political ideologies or economic theories and philosophies. And, you know, we don't want to become, you know, uh, political partisans in the church. We want to have a more transcendent conversation, which, you know, on, on a meta net level, I agree with, except that's not what these 
items are. I, I think they're religi competing religiosities. And if you look at the, you know, uh, the millennial, that's your generation, the generation behind it, that are all in for socialism, it's not because they're staring outside of their uh, surf class hut uh, in, outside Moscow. And, and seeing the bread lines there in St. Petersburg Square, and suddenly, you know, that the, the, the Bolshevik uh, uh, mantras seem a little bit more attractive because the Romanovs suck. No, these are highly educated, very, in terms of human precedent, spoiled generations there that don't see that level of suffering. I think this is religious fervor. The idea that it, it's what Chesterton said, when you, when the government removes the God, the government will become the God, that this is the rival religion to Christianity vying for the hearts and minds in this culture. And, and the church has largely just punted on confronting these things, even though a lot of the people that it wants to reach, Matt, and is bringing in to its into its congregations are infested with this kind of status thinking. And that's that's I mean that that's part of the job of discipleship is going after, you know, the 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 cultural baggage you bring in and transforming it into a Christian world and life view. And I think we're way too complacent about what these what these uh, political mobilizations really are. I think they're rival religions. I would agree with you. And that's why I think uh, we need to start looking at why, what is it about the socialist religion uh, that young people find so appealing? What, what how, Someone like Bernie Sanders, he, he's making his case in a certain way. Well, how is he making that case and why is it appealing? And I think we have to go beyond the normal sort of thing is, oh, well, millennials are a bunch of idiots and they're all entitled and that's and that's the reason. I mean, we, we well, many of us are idiots and we are entitled, but there's there's there is more to it than that. And if that's as far as our analysis is going to go, then then we're going to lose. We're going to lose the entire generation. So what are some of the things that the socialists are doing? Uh, well, I think one is they're making a moral argument. Mm -hmm. okay, they're, they're, they are making the moral argument for all for everything. They don't they don't they don't make practical arguments. They don't make economic arguments. That that's one major misnomer here is we think that this is this is an economic uh, system and that they're and that they're appealing to people on an economic level. Not at all. That's that's not that Bernie Sanders doesn't do that at all. That's why he he can't explain his 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 plans or what he wants to do or how any of it's going to work because that's not the point. His point is. Uh, you know, this is wrong. You've got people that are drowning in debt and you've got the working class and they're suffering and yada, yada, yada. yada. He gives his whole spiel. He says this is wrong. It's 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 morally wrong. And so we just have to fix it. Now, um, I, I disagree with his uh, with his solutions such as they are. But and, and, and often I disagree with the things that he says are, are morally wrong. I think he's wrong on that sometimes, too. But at least but at least he's talking about the moral aspect of it. And I think that that needs to be uh, part of the part of the response from conservatives. And also, I would the other thing is um, socialism is a is an all encompassing sort of thing. And it requires something of you It requires sacrifices. Yeah. Now, with with a caveat, of course, I mean, most of the sacrifices it requires, it's like requiring other people to make those sacrifices like billionaires. But. Again, socialists are at least talking about things like sacrifice, and conservatives don't want to talk about that because we're afraid we're going to scare people away. So sacrifice and uh, morality, uh, I think, are, are the keys. I've been warning our audience as well that the arguments we've traditionally made over the years against, um, against these sorts of status schemes have all been materialistic. Like the argument against Obamacare 10 years ago was we cannot afford it. Well, what if we were running budgets that were balanced like we did at the end of the of the Clinton administration in, in the late 90s? And we technically could afford it. Would that mean forcing nuns to pay for abortions and your and your birth control Would that through Obamacare? Would it be OK then because we can afford it now? And that the, the problem with those kinds of arguments is when the other side is arguing meta and you're arguing material, eventually they're going to start saying things like they're saying now, which is it doesn't matter what it would it cost these are injustices that must be addressed if you would have gone back 170 160 years ago to the christian abolitionist movement and gone into the churches that were preaching abolition and said to them hey it sounds great freeing the slaves and all but you understand that you know that that uh, you know unskilled unpaid labor keeps the cost of goods and services cheap 
and helps the American economy grow, you suddenly start treating all of these people as employees deserving of a living wage. You're going to pay more to correct that injustice. Are you sure you want to pay more when you go to the general store for your goods and services because now we're shelling out living wages to employees in a competitive market? They'd have laughed you out of there because this was a, this was a grave injustice that a, man, a human can own another human being made in, the, made in the image of God. They wouldn't have entertained this materialistic argument. That fervor is now, you see this in the next generation in, in people like Ocasio-Cortez, for example. They're making these kinds of arguments now, which is it doesn't matter what it costs. We spend how much money to invade Afghanistan every week, and yet we can't give a single mom health care. And, and if we're going to come back with, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's the stock uh, you know, market doing and uh, what's uh, the, the inflation rate and quantitative easing, we're going to lose your generation with those kinds of arguments for answers. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's irrelevant to the moral question. Uh, even if it was relevant, it, the fact is that people don't really care that much. So it's not, it's not, it's not moving people. I think this is a, a big misconception people have that, that, you know, mo that voters go to the, uh, go to the ballot box thinking mostly about their wallets. And then, and that's what, and that's what really motivates people. I disagree. I think most people actually aren't thinking about that. I think they're thinking about deeper things like, what is right? What's the right? Thing? That's what motivates people. And the other problem is there's a double edged sword, because when we try to make the utilitarian, as you say, materialistic argument against socialism or against student loan forgiveness or whatever, um, and, and we say, well, that's the reason why we can't do it. Well, then then they can take that and use it against us on, quote, our issues, like something like abortion. And, and they can say, well, you know, if we get rid of abortion, you're going to have all of these unwanted so-called unwanted children out right. on the streets, right. unemployment and so on and so on. Um, and of course, our response to that is, even if it's true, it's completely irrelevant. Who cares? The fact is, you can't kill people. That's mm -hmm. our point. End of discussion. And so I, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. Final question I want to ask you, if, if, and, and take as much time. I've got about uh, three or four minutes here. If to any clergy that are in this audience right now, what would you like to say to them about your book and why they want to read it? Because ultimately, um, you know, that's where a lot of this, the leadership that you want has to come from. It has to come from the people that, that hold the kinds of leadership positions in the church uh, and are supposed to be shepherding the flock. What would you say to them? What I would say is if, if there's one thing I'd want them to take away from the book, I guess it's don't, don't be afraid of scaring people away of, uh, of scaring people out of the pews. Um, because Maybe, maybe you will. You know, the, the thing is, if, if you get up there and you speak the truth and you engage on these issues and you engage with the culture and you really try to fight the spiritual battle, uh, the, the, you, you are. You're, it, the, the, origin, the, the initial impact is that it's going to thin the herd a little bit. People are going to be some people are going to be scared. They're not going to come back. But here's the thing. Those people, they're, they're not really Christian anyway. They're just there taking up space. So maybe that's not such a bad thing. If uh, if they're in the in the beginning, there's a little bit of a of a purge of a self purge of people saying, oh, you know, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't want this. The pruning. And then they yeah. decide not to come back. At least then they they will know where they stand and they'll have to confront who they are and what they really believe. And then once we're at that point, um, now we can now we know what our nucleus is, what our core is as Christians, and we can start building from there. Matt Walsh from The Daily Wire. Check out his new book. Um, it is called Church of Cowards, and it releases on Tuesday. You can pre-order it right now over at Amazon.com. If you just go there and search for either the title of the book, there's a copy of the cover if you're watching on Blaze TV, or search for his name as well. Always good to see you, brother. Thanks for joining us here today on Blaze TV Radio and Podcast. Thanks a lot, Steve. Appreciate it. You bet.